The Things They Carried Chapter 7, Part 1 How to Tell a True War Story This is true. I had a buddy in Vietnam. His name was Bob Kiley, but everyone called him Rap. A friend of his gets killed. So about a week later, Rat sits down and writes a letter to the guy's sister. Rat tells her what a great brother she had, how together the guy was, a number one pal and comrade, a real soldier's soldier, Rat says. Then he tells a few stories to make the point, how her brother would always volunteer for stuff nobody else would volunteer for in a million years, dangerous stuff, like doing recon or going out on those really badass night patrols. Stainless steel balls, Rat tells her. The guy was a little crazy, for sure, but crazy in a good way. A real daredevil, because he liked the challenge of it. He liked testing himself. Just man against gook. A great, great guy, Rat says. Anyways, it's a terrific letter, very personal and touching. Rat almost balls writing it. He gets all teary, telling about the good times they had together, how her brother made the war seem almost fun, always raising hell and lighting up villies and bringing smoke to bear every which way. A great sense of humor, too. Like the time at this river when he went fishing with a whole damn crate of hand grenades. Probably the funniest thing in world history, Rat says. All that gore about 20 zillion dead gook fish. Her brother, he had the right attitude. He knew how to have a good time. On Halloween, this real hot, spooky night, the dude paints up his body in all different colors and puts on this weird mask and hikes over to a vill and goes trick-or-treating almost stark naked, just boots and balls and an M16. A tremendous human being, Rat says. Pretty nuts though sometimes, but you could trust him with your life. And then the letter gets very sad and serious. Rat pours his heart out. He says he loved the guy. He says the guy was his best friend in the world. They were like soulmates, he says, like twins or something. They had a whole lot in common. He tells the guy's sister he'll look her up when the war is over. So what happens? Rat mails the letter. He waits two months. The dumb coos never writes back. A true war story is never moral. It does not instruct, nor encourage virtue, nor suggest models of proper human behavior, nor restrain men from doing the things men have always done. If a story seems moral, do not believe it. If at the end of a war story you feel uplifted, or if you feel that some small bit of rectitude has been salvaged from the larger waste, then you have been made a victim of a very old and terrible lie. There is no rectitude whatsoever. There is no virtue. As a first rule of thumb, therefore, you can tell a true war story by its absolute and uncompromising allegiance to obscenity and evil. Listen to Rat Kylie. Coos, he says. He does not say bitch. He does not say woman or girl. He says coos. And he spits and stares. He's 19 years old. It's too much for him. So he looks at you with those big, sad, gentle killer eyes and says coos because his friend is dead and because it's so incredibly sad and true. She never wrote back. You can tell a true war story if it embarrasses you. If you don't care for obscenity, you don't care for the truth. If you don't care for the truth, watch how you vote. Send guys to war, they come home talking dirty. Listen to Rat. Jesus, man, I write this beautiful fucking letter. I slave over it. And what happens? The dumb coos never writes back. The dead guy's name was Kurt Lemon. What happened was, we crossed the muddy river and marched west into the mountains, and on the third day we took a break along a trail junction in deep jungle. Right away, 
Lemon and Rat Kylie started goofing. They didn't understand about the spookiness. They were kids. They just didn't know. A natural hike, they thought. Not even a war. So they went off into the shade of some giant trees. Quadruple canopy, no sunlight at all. And they were giggling and calling each other Yellow Mother and playing a silly game they'd invented. The game involved smoke grenades, which were harmless unless you did stupid things. And what they did was pull out the pin and stand a few feet apart and play catch under the shade of those huge trees. Whoever chickened out was a yellow mother. And if nobody chickened out, the grenade would make a light popping sound and they'd be covered with smoke and they'd laugh and dance around and then do it again. It's all exactly true. It happened to me nearly 20 years ago, and I still remember that trail junction and those giant trees and a soft dripping sound somewhere up beyond the trees. I remember the smell of moss. Up in the canopy, there were tiny white blossoms, but no sunlight at all. And I remember the shadows spreading out under the trees where Kurt Lemon and Rat Kylie were playing catch with smoke grenades. Mitchell Sanders sat flipping his yo-yo. Norman Bowker and Kiawa and Dave Jensen were dozing, or half dozing. And all around us were those ragged green mountains. Except for the laughter, things were quiet. At one point, I remember, Mitchell Sanders turned and looked at me, not quite nodding, as if to warn me about something. Then after a while, he rolled up his yo-yo and moved away. It's hard to tell you what happened next. They were just goofing. There was a noise, I suppose, which must have been the detonator. So I glanced behind me and watched Lemon step from the shade into bright sunlight. His face was suddenly brown and shining, a handsome kid, really. Sharp gray eyes, lean and narrow-waisted, and when he, he, when he died, it was almost beautiful. The way the sunlight came around him and lifted him up and sucked him high into a tree full of moss and vines and white blossoms. In any war story, but especially a true one, it's difficult to separate what happened from what seemed to happen. What seems to happen becomes its own happening and has to be told that way. The angles of vision are skewed. When a booby trap explodes, you close your eyes and duck and float outside yourself. When a guy dies, like Kurt Lemon, you look away and then look back for a moment and then look away again. The pictures get jumbled. You tend to miss a lot. And then afterwards, when you go to tell about it, there is always that surreal seeminess, which makes the story seem untrue, but which in fact represents the hard and exact truth as it seemed. In many cases, a true war story cannot be believed. If you believe it, be skeptical. It's a question of credibility. Often, the crazy stuff is true, and the normal stuff isn't, because the normal stuff is necessary to make you believe the truly incredible craziness. In other cases, you can't even tell a true war story. Sometimes it's just beyond telling. I heard this one, for example, from Mitchell Sanders. It was near dusk, and we were sitting at my foxhole along a wide, muddy river north of Quang Ngai City. I remember how peaceful the twilight was, a deep, pinkish red spilled out on the river, which moved without sound, and in the morning we would cross the river and march west into the mountains. The occasion was ripe for a good story. God's truth, Mitchell Sanders says. A six-man patrol goes up into the mountains on a basic listening post operation. The idea is to spend a week up there, just lie low and listen for enemy movement. They've got a radio along, so if they hear anything suspicious, anything, they're supposed to call in artillery or gunships, whatever it takes. Otherwise, they keep strict field discipline, absolute silence. They just listen. Sanders glanced at me to make sure I had the scenario. He was playing with his yo-yo, dancing it with a short, tight strokes of the wrist. His face was blank in the dusk. We're talking regulation by the book LP. These six guys, they don't say boo for a solid week. They don't got tongues. All ears. 
Right, I said. You understand me? Invisible. Sanders nodded. Affirm, he said. Invisible. So what happens is these guys get themselves deep in the bush, all camouflaged up, and they lie down and wait. That's all they do. Nothing else. They lie there for seven straight days and just listen. And man, I'll tell you, it's spooky. This is mountains. You don't know spooky until you've been there. Jungle, sort of, except it's way up in the clouds and there's always this fog, like rain, except it's not raining. Everything's all wet and swirly and tangled up. You can't see Jack. You can't find your own pecker to piss with. Like you don't even have a body. Serious spooky. You just go with the vapors. The fog sort of takes you in. And the sounds, man, the sounds carry forever. You hear stuff nobody should ever hear. Sanders was quiet for a second, just working the yo-yo. Then he smiled at me. So after a couple of days, the guys start hearing this real soft, kind of whacked out music. Weird echoes and stuff. Like a radio or something. But it's not a radio. It's this strange gook music that comes right out of the rocks. Far away, sort of. But right up close, too. They try to ignore it. But it's a listening post, right? So they listen. And every night they hear that crazy-ass gook concert. All kind of chimes and xylophones, I mean. This is wilderness. No way. It can't be real. But there it is. Like the mountains are tuned in to radio fucking Hanoi. Naturally, they get nervous. One guy sticks juicy fruit in his ears. Another guy almost flips. Thing is, though, they can't report the music. They can't get on the horn and call back to base and say, hey, listen, we need some firepower. We got to blow away this weird gook rock band. They can't do that. It wouldn't go down. So they lie there in the fog, and keep their mouths shut. And what makes it extra bad, see, is the poor dudes can't horse around like normal, can't joke it away, can't even talk to each other except maybe in whispers, all hush-hush. And that just revs up the willies. All they do is listen. Again, there was some silence as Mitchell Sanders looked out on the river. The dark was coming in hard now, and off to the west I could see the mountains rising in silhouette, all the mysteries and unknowns. This next part, Sanders said quietly, you won't believe. Probably not, I said. You won't. And you know why? He gave me a long, tired smile. Because it happened. Because every word is absolutely dead-on true. Sanders made a sound in his throat, like a sigh, as if to say he didn't care if I believed him or not. But he did care. He wanted me to feel the truth to believe by the raw force of feeling. He seemed sad in a way. These six guys, he said, they're pretty fried out by now. And one night they start hearing voices, like at a cocktail party. That's what it sounds like, this big swank gook cocktail party somewhere out there in the fog. Music and chit-chat and stuff. It's crazy, I know, but they hear the champagne corks. They hear the actual martini glasses. Real hoity-toity, all very civilized, except this isn't civilization. This is Nam. Anyway, the guys try to be cool. They just lie there and groove. But after a while, they start hearing, you won't believe this, they hear chamber music. They hear violins and cellos. They hear this terrific Mama San soprano. Then after a while, they hear gook opera and a glee club and the Haiphong Boys Choir and a barbershop quartet and all kinds of funky chanting and Buddha Buddha stuff. And the whole time in the background, there's still that cocktail party going on. All these different voices. Not human voices, though, because it's the mountains. Follow me. The rock. It's talking. And the fog, too. And the grass and the goddamn mongooses. Everything talks. The trees talk politics. And the monkeys talk religion. The whole country, Vietnam, the place talks. It talks, you understand. Nam, it truly talks. The guys can't cope. They lose it. They get on the radio and report enemy movement. The whole army, they say, and they order up the firepower. They get arty and gunships. They call in airstrikes. And I'll tell you, they fucking crash that cocktail party. All night long, they just smoke those mountains. They make jungle juice. They blow away trees and glee clubs and whatever else there is to blow away. Scorch time. They walk napalm up and down the ridges. 
They bring in the Cobras and F4s. They use Willie Peter and HE and incendiaries. It's all fire. They make those mountains burn. But around dawn, things finally get quiet. Like you've never heard quiet before. One of those real thick, real misty days. Just fog and clouds. They're off in this silent zone. And the mountains are absolutely dead flat, silent. Like Brigadoon, pure vapor, you know. Everything's all sucked up inside the fog. Not a single sound, except they still hear it. So they pack up and start humping. They head down the mountain, back to base camp. And when they get there, they don't say diddly. They don't talk. Not a word. Like they're deaf and dumb. Later on, this fat bird colonel comes up and asks what the hell happened out there. What'd they hear? Why all the ordinance? The man's ragged out. He gets down tight on their case. I mean, they spent six trillion dollars on firepower, and his fat-ass colonel wants answers. He wants to know what the fucking story is. But the guys don't say zip. They just look at him for a while, sort of funny-like, sort of amazed. And the whole war is right there in that stare. It says everything you can't ever say. It says, man, you've got wax in your ears. It says, poor bastard, you'll never know. Wrong frequency. You don't even want to hear this. Then they salute the fucker and walk away because certain stories you don't ever tell. You can tell a true war story by the way it never seems to end. Not then, not ever. Not when Mitchell Sanders stood up and moved off into the dark. It all happened. Even now, at this instant, I remember that yo-yo. In a way, I suppose, you had to be there. You had to hear it. But I could tell you how desperately Sanders wanted me to believe him. His frustration not quite getting the details right, not quite pinning down the final and definitive truth. And I remember sitting in my foxhole that night, watching the shadows of Kuang Yai, thinking about the coming day and how we would cross the river and march west into the mountains, all the ways I might die, all the things I did not understand. Late in the night, Mitchell Sanders touched my shoulder. Just came to me, he whispered. The moral, I mean. Nobody listens. Nobody hears nothing. Like that fat-ass colonel. The politicians, all the civilian types. Your girlfriend. My girlfriend. Everybody's sweet little virgin girlfriend. What they need is to go out on LP. The vapors, man. The trees and rocks. You've got to listen to your enemy. And then again, in the morning, Sanders came up to me. The platoon was preparing to move out, checking weapons, going through all the rituals that preceded a day's march. Already the lead squad had crossed the river and was filing off towards the west. I got a confession to make, Sanders said. Last night, man, I had to make a few things up. I know that. The glee club. There wasn't any glee club. Right. And no opera. Forget it. I understand. Yeah, but listen, it's still true. Those six guys, they heard wicked sound out there. They heard sound you just plain won't believe. Sanders pulled up his rucksack, closed his eyes for a moment, and let out a short, throat-clearing sigh. I knew what was coming. All right, I said, what's the moral? Forget it. No, go ahead. For a long while, he was quiet, looking away, and the silence kept stretching out until it was almost embarrassing. Then he shrugged and gave me a stare that lasted all day. Hear that quiet, man? He said, that quiet. Just listen. There's your moral. In a true war story, if there's a moral at all, it's like the thread that makes the cloth. You can't tease it out. You can't extract the meaning without unraveling the deeper meaning. And in the end, really, there's nothing much to say about a true war story, except maybe, oh, true war stories do not generalize. They do not indulge in abstraction or analysis. For example, war is hell. As a moral declaration, the old truism seems perfectly true. And yet, because it abstracts, because it generalizes, 
I can't believe it with my stomach. Nothing turns inside. It comes down to gut instinct. A true war story, if truly told, makes the stomach believe. This one does it for me. I've told it before, many times, many versions. But here's what actually happened. We crossed the river and marched west into the mountains. On the third day, Kurt Lemon stepped on a booby-trapped 105 round. He was playing catch with Rat Kylie, laughing, and then he was dead. The trees were thick. It took nearly an hour to cut an LZ for the dust off. Later, higher in the mountains, we came across a baby VC water buffalo. What it was doing there, I don't know. No farms or paddies. But we chased it down and got a rope around it and led it along to a deserted village where we set up for that night. After supper, Rat Kylie went over and stroked its nose. He opened up a can of sea rations, pork and beans, but the baby buffalo wasn't interested. Rat shrugged. He stepped back and shot it through the right front knee. The animal did not make a sound. It went down hard, then got up again. Rat took careful aim and shot off an ear. He shot it in the hindquarters and the little hump at its back. He shot it twice in the flanks. It wasn't to kill, it was to hurt. He put the rifle muzzle up against the mouth and shot the mouth away. Nobody said much. The whole platoon stood there watching, feeling all kinds of things. But there wasn't a great deal of pity for the baby water buffalo. Kurt Lemon was dead. Rat Kylie had lost his best friend in the world. Later in the week, he would write a long personal letter to the guy's sister, who would not write back. But for now, it was a question of pain. He shot off the tail. He shot away chunks of meat below the ribs. All around us, there was the smell of smoke and filth and deep greenery, and the evening was humid and hot. Rat went to automatic. He shot randomly, almost casually, quick little spurts in the belly and butt. Then he reloaded, squatted down, and shot it in the front left knee. Again, the animal fell hard and tried to get up, but this time it couldn't quite make it. It wobbled and went down sideways. Rat shot it in the nose. He bent forward and whispered something, as if talking to a pet. Then he shot it in the throat. All the while, the baby buffalo was silent, or almost silent, just a light bubbling sound where the nose had been. It lay very still. Nothing moved except the eyes, which were enormous, the pupils shiny, black, and dumb. Rat Kylie was crying. He tried to say something, but then cradled his rifle and went off by himself. The rest of us stood in a rag circle around the baby buffalo. For a time, no one spoke. We had witnessed something essential, something brand new and profound, a piece of the world so startling there was not yet a name for it. Someone kicked the baby buffalo. It was still alive, but just barely, just in the eyes. Amazing, Dave Jensen said. My whole life, I've never seen anything like it. Never? Not hardly, not once. Kiawa and Mitchell Sanders picked up the baby buffalo. They hauled it across the open square, hoisted it up, and dumped it in the village well. Afterwards, we sat waiting for Rat to get himself together. Amazing, Dave Jensen kept saying. A new wrinkle. I've never seen it before. Mitchell Sanders took out his yo-yo. That's Nam, he said. Garden of evil. Over here, man, every sin's real, fresh, and original. How do you generalize? War is hell, but that's not the half of it. Because war is also mystery and terror and adventure and courage and discovery and holiness and pity and despair and longing and love. War is nasty. War is fun. War is thrilling. War is drudgery. War makes you a man. War makes you dead. The truths are contradictory. It can be argued, for instance, that war is grotesque. But in truth, war is also beauty. For all its horror, you can't help but gape at the awful majesty of combat. You stare out at tracer rounds, unwinding through the dark like brilliant red ribbons. You crouch in ambush as a cool and passive moon rises over the nighttime patties. You admire the fluid symmetry of troops on the move, the harmonies of sound and shape and proportion the great sheets of metal fire 
streaming down from a gunship. The illumination rounds, the white phosphorus, the purpley orange glow of napalm, the rocket's red glare. It's not pretty exactly. It's astonishing. It fills the eye. It commands you. You hate it, yes, but your eyes do not. Like a forest fire, like cancer under a microscope, any battle or bombing raid or artillery barrage has the aesthetic purity of absolute moral indifference, a powerful, implacable beauty. And a truer war story will tell the truth about this, though the truth is ugly. To generalize about war is like generalizing about peace. Almost everything is true. Almost nothing is true. At its core, perhaps, war is just another name for death. And yet any soldier will tell you, if he tells the truth, that proximity to death brings with it a corresponding proximity to life. After a firefight, there is always the immense pleasure of aliveness. The trees are alive. The grass, the soil, everything. All around you, things are purely living, and you among them. And the aliveness makes you tremble. You feel an intense out-of-the-skin awareness of your living self, your truest self, the human being you want to be and then become by the force of wanting it. In the midst of evil, you want to be a good man. You want decency. You want justice and courtesy and human concord, things you never knew you wanted. There's a kind of largeness to it, a kind of godliness. Though it's odd, you're never more alive than when you're almost dead. You recognize what's valuable. Freshly, as if for the first time, you love what's best in yourself and in the world, all that might be lost. At the hour of dusk, you sit at your foxhole and look out on a wide river turning pinkish and at the mountains beyond. And although in the morning you must cross the river and go into the mountains and do terrible things and maybe die, even so, you find yourself studying the fine colors on the river you feel wonder and awe at the setting of the sun, and you are filled with a hard, aching love for how the world could be and always should be, but now is not. Mitchell Sanders was right. For the common soldier, at least, war has the feel, the spiritual texture of a great ghostly fog, thick and permanent. There is no clarity. Everything swirls. The old rules are no longer binding, the old truths no longer true. Right spills over into wrong, order blends into chaos, love to hate, ugliness to beauty, law to anarchy, civility to savagery. The vapors suck you in. You can't tell where you are or why you're there, and the only certainty is overwhelming ambiguity. In war, you lose your sense of the definite, hence your sense of truth itself, and therefore it's safe to say that in a true war story, nothing is ever absolutely 